Hello, I'm Stephen Batchuk, and welcome to the second episode in our Uncorked Vlog series. Uh, in this episode, we'll be looking at wine in the cradle of civilization. Now, there, of course, has long been a question as to which came first, beer or wine. Uh, but this binary approach really is a poor way of looking at it. As we saw with the previous episode, the most important element to the fermentation process is yeast. And as Lucas noted, uh, yeast can be found all over the place. Grapes are actually one of the few fruits on which the, grease, the, the yeast will grow naturally. Uh, and therefore it would have been one of the first fruits probably to be converted into an alcohol. Honey as well is another uh, natural source of the yeast necessary to convert the sugars that are found in abundance in, in uh, honey into an alcohol. And so from a simplicity standpoint, wine and mead probably preceded beer. When exactly this happened, of course, this is still a matter of debate, uh, but for the intentional making of wine, uh, we now at least have a better idea, and it's tied to the agricultural revolution of the Neolithic period in the ancient Near East. Now, it's in this period that we see the development of settled village life, architecture, ritual and cult, and most especially agriculture. Not just the growing of crops, but the creating of secondary products from, from them, like things like bread and porridge, dried fruit, and yes, probably even alcohol. Uh, this happened earliest in what's known as the Fertile Crescent, which spans uh, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Palestine, and then the fringes of, of Turkey and Iran, uh, where the, the progenitors of the earliest domesticated crops grew naturally. But once established there, the Neolithic way of life spread both inwards into the more harsh environments of Mesopotamia and then outwards into the more different environments where a significantly greater diversity of plants were to be found. Now last episode we spoke of the stories of the origin of wine and there are many uh, and when you take them together there's this interesting parallel in themes and in geography. Uh, where a hero survives a flood that has been sent by the gods and he lands on a mountain which appears to be somewhere near the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates River, i.e. in eastern Anatolia and Caucasia. And one of the first things that's either discovered or planted are grapes, and wine is made. Now, Caucasia, the region that encompasses parts of eastern Turkey, uh, mod the modern republics of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, uh, interestingly, they contain the largest number of grape varieties in the world, close to 500 uh, different indigenous varieties. And this number is understood to be the result of ha them having been domesticated early and living and intermixing uh, in the region for a long period of time. So it was a logical place to look for the earliest evidence for the of the domestication of grape and the production of wine. Now, archaeological investigations have been going on in Georgia under the Soviets since the 1930s, and Neolithic sites were uh, being discovered, and they're producing storage jars with images of clusters of grapes on them, or even images of little stick figure men uh, dancing under hanging grapes, uh, suggesting that grapes might have played an important uh, part in this culture. Now, all this data combined led Patrick McGovern of the University of Pennsylvania, who I sort of like to describe as the godfather of all things ancient alcohol, uh, to suggest that grapes may have first been domesticated and wine purposely made in this region. Now, some of the new excavations I've been involved with in the Republic of Georgia, that's funded partially by the National Wine Agency, to give you an idea of the importance of wine to this country, ha have revealed more of this Neolithic culture. But more importantly, have produced evidence of the earliest pure grape wine, uh, and that it was made at a number of these small Neolithic villages, showing that sometime around 5980, wine production appears to be moderately well spread throughout the region. A little later and a little further south, excavations at the late Neolithic site of Hajifurus Tepe in northwestern Iran showed that by 5400 BC, not only has wine making spread to this region, but a more important technological innovation has emerged. Chemical analysis of vessels from the site not only produced the telltale evidence for wine, but also showed terebinth resin, that is a tree sap that was used in antiquity as a preservative for wine. Think you know, Greek retsina, that it gets its name from the tree resin that is used as the preservative. About a thousand years later, and even further south in Iran, at the site of Godin Tepe in, in the Hamadan region, excavations by the University of Toronto uncovered what can best be described as, as a treating entrepot, 
where people from the Mesopotamian heartland had moved up uh, into Iran and settled to funnel trade goods down uh, into the lowlands. Chemical analysis of some of the liquid storage jars uh, found there also showed evidence of wine, showing that already by the mid fourth millennium, so 3500 BC, uh, wine was a, a commodity that was being traded and shipped down into the Mesopotamian heartland. By the mid third millennium BC, we have extensive written records, which start to document the trade in wine. The text from the city of uh, Ebla near modern Aleppo in Syria revealed that wine was purchased and traded by the palace, and it was coming in from the surrounding fields, but also from further afield to the west around uh, the uh, Antioch region, but also north and east from, to the Euphrates region near the modern Turkish Syrian border. Up in the Euphrates region, sites like Titrasuyuk were fairly large urban centers. Uh, this one here even had suburbs, believe it or not. And it's in these suburbs that a large number of the houses that were found had wine presses in them. Wine production seems to have been highly decentralized, with individual houses each pressing wine, which presumably would have been collected by the city center, and then sent out to other centers like Karkemesh, and then further on to important places like Ebla or Mari. Now the site of Mari on the Euphrates uh, is more important in the second millennium. This is where we see wine become cemented as a more common beverage for all. Uh, Mari is on the Euphrates near the modern Syrian Iraqi border and it becomes this major depot and redistributor of wine, sending shipments as far south as Sippar in Iraq down near modern Baghdad. Texts talk of royal gifts uh, of wine going, well, coming to the city or even going out to other kings and wine was stored in large storerooms in the palace known as Kanu. Detailed tablets talk of the wine trade uh, from, well, places up north and west, so from Carchemish and Titrus, but also the Aleppo region, and also even further east in the, the, the Tigris area. And wine is all coming to Mari from these regions. Moreover, the texts actually give us an idea of how profitable the trade in wine could be. With one shekel of silver buying you six jars uh, oh, that were equal to about 180 liters or 47 gallons of wine in Karkemesh. And these same jars will sell for two and a half shekels when they arrive in Mari. When they arrive down south in Mesopotamia at, at a site like Sippar, those same six jars will sell for four shekels. So therefore the wine trade could actually be quite profitable. But how much wine are we actually talking about here? Uh, Later texts, a couple hundred years later, texts from a site called Alalak in modern Turkey can give us an idea. A census list for this small kingdom, it's only about 600 square miles, and it was a vassal state of the larger kingdom of Aleppo, records the number of settlements in its control, as well as the number of fields and vineyards. You know, even 4,000 years ago, they needed to, all this info for taxes. What's interesting is they tell us that each household had one and a half uh, acres of vineyards. Now, based on the number of settlements, we can estimate the amount of vineyards and the amount of wine that's being produced. The smaller villages could produce 3,000 gallons of wine, and the medium-sized towns about 4,900 gallons of wine, and the large cities about 15,000 gallons of wine. Multiplying by the number of settlements, this one small kingdom can produce over 3 million gallons of wine, with the equivalent of 1.69 million modern wine bottles. The, uh, the amount of wine that's being produced in the greater Mesopotamian world was really staggering. And think of it, this was 4,000 years ago, and it just continues from there. By the first millennium BC, Production is on steroids. Large tracts of central northern Syria are brought under irrigation to create these vast vineyards to feed the, the main power of the time, the kingdom of Assyria. For the commemoration of, of the city of Kalhu, the capital city of Kalhu, modern Nimrud, uh, in 879 BC, the Assyrian king Ashurnasirpal II demanded 10,000 skins of wine for the housewarming party alone. Uh, in Neo-Syrian art, we see some of the earliest symposia, wine drinking parties uh, that are found in art of this empire. Images of grapes and wine drinking are just found everywhere. 
all this to show that wine was not something that was introduced by the Greeks that some people like to suggest, but it's one that has an even longer history in the cradle of civilization. I hope this all too brief introduction is giving you an idea of the importance of wine in the ancient Near East. If you want to learn more, check out some of the books written by Patrick McGovern, where he lays out much, much more of it in greater detail. And please keep turning, tuning into Uncorked. In our next episode, we'll be looking at the other beverage of choice in the ancient world, beer.